Welcome everyone. Just a little bit about the West Island Cancer Wellness Center first, uh, for the people who haven't been with us before. Uh, what is cancer wellness? What does it mean? Cancer wellness is defined as a holistic approach that supports the entire person at any stage of care trajectory when living with cancer or when one is a caregiver to someone living with cancer. Research confirms that necessity to consider all these psychosocial needs are part of wellness. And by doing this, there is, em is empirical evidence of the beneficial effects on healing and or the journey. So we at the West Island Cancer Wellness Center offer programs and services that are free of charge, thanks to our generous donors, volunteers, and our own fundraising efforts. Efforts, sorry, We work with a large team of professionals and we are about to enter our 14th year of existence as we continue for work closely with the cancer care offered in hospitals. So tonight, Dr. Marty Pelcher, Director of the ID Walk in Clinic, the medical lead for the antibacterial stewardship program at the Jewish General Hospital. A West Island boy who went to Banyer and then McGill and then went on to graduate with degrees and honors, microbiology, immunology, epidemiology, and medicine. He completed his res residency internal medicine, infectious disease, and medical microbiology in 2010. Dr. Telcher initially worked at the Lachine Hospital as an internist and intensive care physician, and was then brought on as an infectious disease and medical microbiology specialist. He played an important role in the early days of integrating the Lachine Hospital into the MUHC network. 2014, Dr. Telcher returned to the Jewish General Hospital where he had been the chief medical resident during his training. He is proud to be part of an amazing team making up the Jewish General Hospital and the McGill Divisions of Infectious Disease and Optilab MUHC Montreal Cluster. He is currently the director of the Jewish General Hospital Infectious Disease Walk-In Clinic and medical lead for the Antibacterial Stewardship Program for the CIUSSS Montreal, the Sears. Dr. Telcher is one of the co-actors of the Jewish General Hospital, the Sears Montreal of COVID guidelines. He is a colleague served as a regular advisor, support, and consults for the COVID wards throughout the early pandemic. Most importantly, he is lucky to be married to a great person and have three kids in high school and is lucky to be living minutes from his park, his parents, and where he grew up. So welcome, Dr. Telcher. So what we will do is we will start with questions. I will be asking Dr. Telcher questions um, and with response. And as I mentioned, please put your questions at the bottom in the chat. And then Stacy will be able to uh, monitor the questions. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Really, it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to the group. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. I hope to be able to clarify as much as possible and answer as many questions as you have. Uh, I'm here to be of service tonight to you guys. Uh, I did not present, uh, I did not pr prepare a formal presentation because uh, the list of questions that I received was uh, long, uh, and I think that they're all pertinent, and uh, I hope to be able to get to all of them so that uh, everyone everyone is satisfied, uh, you know, with, with the answers and with the information they receive. So, uh, without further ado, let's let's jump into it. Exactly. So let's start with our COVID questions. We divided it in COVID questions, and some questions is COVID and cancer questions. Uh, can you provide an overview of where we stand now with the pandemic? 
uh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> so a lot of the answers can start with the answer, it depends. Um, uh, so I'll skip saying that every time, but it, it kind of depends. So it depends what the question really is. Like, are we talking about Montreal? Are we talking about Quebec? Are we talking about Canada? COVID is really different in different geographic states. And even within our different pockets, um, there's different things going on with different subgroups. So uh, the, other, the other part of it is that we've kind of lost an idea about what the actual transmission is like in the community right now. We're reliant uh, extensively on uh, wastewater studies, which have a two week lag. Uh, to give us an idea about the amount of virus that's being shed in the community. And that's usually a harbinger of uh, things to come. So as waves are about to begin, the wastewater levels uh, of, of SARS-CoV-2 start to increase. Um, so depending on when you look at it and how much of it you want to you know, put weight into, uh, it seems that uh, COVID is in a steady rate of transmission. It doesn't seem to have gone into another peak yet. Uh, here in, in Quebec, we are still sort of 50 to 70% looking at the variant of Omicron known as BA4 or 5, mainly BA5. And we're slowly starting to see uh, BA1, uh, sorry, BQ1 and BQ11 variants which are coming in probably mainly from the United States and uh, where, where they're more prevalent right now. And so that's the newest type of uh, variant of concern. So, you know, there's things that are on the horizon uh, with respect to COVID. We're waiting to see if the holiday period uh, turns into another mass spreader event and another wave, uh, especially because there are almost no mitigating factors in place uh, at this point. Uh, uh, you know, the recommendation to wear a mask is pretty much, you know, ignored by the vast majority of the population. So uh, there is transmission, there is COVID, but there's also influenza, RSV, and other respiratory viruses. So it's gonna be an interesting interplay because there are theories of viral interference where if you catch one virus, your body produces certain types of molecules, which may help you against catching other types of viruses. But uh, there's plenty of people who are still very capable of catching a trifecta of COVID, influenza, and RSV, um, especially uh, with altered immune systems. So I don't think it's a time right now where we're seeing a lot of hospital uh, severe cases in hospital. There are still definitely some cases coming in, uh, nowhere near anything like we saw in the first, second, or third wave. Okay. Um, but uh, there's there's still reasons to be careful and to be vigilant. And uh, but there's there's hope because the virus that we have now is definitely muted compared to what we had initially. So the current guidelines, definitely, we should continue to follow to be the best way to stay safe. That also depends on what guidelines you're talking about. <laughs> so yeah, um, I, 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 I'm going to try to not be sarcastic or cynical, um, but a, a lot of it has become overly politicized. Um, much of it is being driven by what groups may like to hear as opposed to what they should be hearing. Um, a classic example of this would be why there are masks being worn in government buildings, but not in schools. Uh, it's a little weird, um, you know, so uh, it, it's, it's situations like that, which are incongruent with best evidence that make some of the guidelines and recommendations difficult. So a recommendation is not a mandate. So telling people that they should should wear a mask when they you know when they're in situations where they think they might be in crowds or at risk, yeah, that's that's fine. But it shouldn't be a recommendation. It should be that when you're going indoors right now, masks should be worn and everybody should be wearing masks indoors. 
especially in schools where ventilation is extremely poor. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would say there are decent guidelines out there. Um, many of them are American, uh, like the NIH guidelines, the IDSA guidelines, CDC guidelines. Uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines are fine. It's when you start getting into the provincial guidelines that things start getting a little weird and it can, it can really deviate from one province to another, even though we're all basically North American humans. Yeah. So I, I don't understand why it's so different between each province. Uh, it's really probably has like political overtones more than anything else. I mean, a lot of people, you know, what they're scared of is that how long when somebody is tested positive, are they contagious? Because, you know, we went to 14 days, to 10 days, to five yeah. days. So yeah. a lot of people wonder, you know, how long can you be yeah. contagious with COVID? So it depends. <laughs> so, so initially, when we started looking at COVID, we were looking at... Uh, classic coronavirus because COVID is not the first coronavirus uh COVID is is sort of it's a it's a cousin of SARS which came years ago and it's also a cousin of MERS which is sort of you know pops in and out of the Middle East um, but there are other coronaviruses that are seasonal coronaviruses that have been with us for decades and decades if not longer True. and so initially uh it was thought that we should you know put a label on this, that's probably 14 days of contagiousness. Mm -hmm. So transmissibility of 14 days. Then there were studies that came out, some from Germany, some from Canada, showing that even if the PCR is positive, they could not culture live virus after 10 days from a patient uh, who was swabbed for PCR and also swabbed simultaneously for culture. So that's where the original 10 days of infectivity or transmissibility came from. And then we learned that people with altered immune systems might actually be shedding active virus for longer. So that's where we started getting into people with severe COVID uh, who end up in the ICU uh, requiring 21 days just to be safe, 21 days of isolation and for people with immunodeficiency uh, requiring up to 28 days. Okay. But what I can also tell you is that there are some individuals with extremely altered immune systems uh, who have a hard time shaking COVID at all and who can actually produce transmissible viral particles for weeks and months. Okay. So, but the majority of people who are otherwise healthy, it's still really 10 days. And for people with mildly altered immune systems, but which still have some type of an Im immune response, uh, it could be as long as 28 days when altered. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of people also still think that it can be spread from services. This, you know, that you have to, people are still wondering, should we still disinfect, you know, when you come bring your stuff from the groceries and continue to do the same process all the time? Should we? Yeah, so um, part of my introduction didn't, didn't mention how paranoid I am um, and uh, how much, uh, how, how many uh, 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 different kind of lingettes I use to wipe down everything for the first few months of this. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't clear initially what the I guess the survivability or, or, or the viral particles had on different types of materials, because there, there is information from MERS and SARS and other coronaviruses that depending on, and it depends on many different factors, okay? So it depends on the actual surface material, the relative ambient temperature, humidity of the air, amount of UV in the environment, um, all of these things are of, uh, are a, a play into it, but ultimately, I think it's more or less shown that fomite transmission, so the term fomite transmission is inanimate objects that are able to 
uh, transmit disease. That's what a fomite is, is not a principal transmission mechanism for this virus. So I eventually abandoned all of this. I think that hand washing coming in from outdoors is probably a good way to mitigate most of those problems. Uh, you know, some people still embargo stuff they bring into the house and they'll keep it, you know, away for two to three to four days and not touch it. Yeah. To let whatever viral particles may be on there sort of decay, uh, expose it to direct sunlight, which is uh, UV irradiation, which should take care of it. I really don't think that's necessary at, at this point. Um, it, it's, it's really been shown to have a mechanism that is principally um, droplet contact and probably uh, it, it, I don't use the term airborne because that's not completely correct. I would use the term, uh, um, it's, it's the term we use is, um, See, in my mind, I'm saying proximity airborne because that's what we used to say like when we were talking about this, but aerosol is okay. what we usually use to describe it. So aerosol, as if I could describe very briefly, so aerosol is different than airborne in the sense that aerosol is fine particles that are usually restricted to a closer space to the origin from which it comes from. Okay. So you could think of it like if you guys know the, this is the best way I could describe it to people is the characters from Charlie Brown from Peanuts. There's one character called Pigpen. So Pigpen walks around in like this cloud of dust because he's kind of a dirty little kid. So I'm not saying that people who have COVID are dirty. That's not what I'm saying. But when they breathe and when they cough, they produce clouds of fine particles of different size that stay suspended around them for a certain amount of time. And should you walk through that cloud, even if you didn't get hit with a, like a one of these particles that's supposed to drop within two meters, mm -hmm. there is a chance you inhale an infective dose that is sufficient to create disease. Okay. So wiping down things, not so much a problem. Uh, you could probably abandon that, but you know, protecting yourself in a crowded room or poorly ventilated room, that's and hand washing is probably the way to go. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so um, how long can you continue to be positive? Because sometimes people think after five days they have no symptoms and they're not positive anymore. How long can they have COVID? Yeah. So there's, uh, there's, there's, so the answer to that is also it depends. But it, bottom line here is that, um, PCR positivity can go on for weeks. Um, in people who have altered immune systems or who have various types of treatments that alter their immune system, they could shed virus viral particles for longer periods of time. And uh, while the rapid ant antigen test may become negative faster, um, the PCR may remain positive for considerably longer. Now, does that mean that there's active particles or that they have enough particles in their upper airway in order to transmit it to someone else? Debatable, probably not. Um, but it, it, it's, there's still sort of a little bit of a gray zone there about making a declaration. There's no set number of days where someone will be defined as, you know, test positive, test negative, and say, oh, you have COVID, you're going to be positive for five days. Everyone's a little different. Everyone clears it a little differently. I'll give you an example. I had COVID not long ago. I, we were discussing that before we started. And uh, I did a rapid test, which I really don't like the rapid tests, but I did a rapid test because I know that if it's positive, at least that almost like almost 100% going to be true. If it's, if it's not positive, I don't, I don't even use the term negative. If it's not positive, that doesn't help you much. So I did my first test. It was blazing hot positive. I did. I was like, I, I, I can't believe that this is positive. I just couldn't believe it because I basically sleep in an N95. And then the next, the next test I did was 30 minutes later, 
and I was I was swabbing myself, and it was positive but weaker. And then I was like, "This is weird." So I did another one thirty minutes later, and it was clearly not positive. So I was like, "What what is going on?" I didn't know if I really had COVID or not. So I did a I, I did a deep swab on myself, which I would never recommend anyone try, and sent it to the lab that night, and it was positive by PCR. Okay. So it's it's very it's it's a very funny thing. Uh, the different tests will give you different results, so you have to be careful with that. Don't don't uh, think that there's a magic number for this because there is not. And is it important that we do swab inside of our mouth first and then go to the nostril? So I would say for rapid tests, it's, this is an opinion, uh, more of an opinion that it's probably best to try to maximize the amount of antigen you're collecting. Okay. So whether you do mouth, throat, cheek, cheek, throat, nose, uh, what, whatever, whatever you do, as long as you get the nose and then you choose something, probably your throat and cheek, I would say are good things. So even though that's not part of the instructions on the rapid tests, most rapid tests do not recommend taking a throat swab. You don't need a nasopharyngeal swab. You could do the, the anterior, uh, the turbinate or the inside of the nostril, right where the sort of the air hole opens. And then you could do the throat and you can also do the cheek. And then you're set and you can follow the instructions from that point on, making sure to follow the time recommendations very, very carefully. Okay. Many people have been calling me about, you know, can I leave it in for another five minutes in the prep time in order to like, see if I get a better result. I said, no, to get the better result, you collect more sample and you leave it in for two, whatever it is, two minutes on those green boxes mm -hmm. and then 15 minutes and not a second longer uh, for the developer. Because many people have been asking me, well, why is mine positive at 30 minutes? I said, I don't know. Uh, no one's supposed to look at it at 30 minutes. Exactly. So, so when it's 15 minutes and one second, you throw that test out if it's not positive. Okay. Okay. And definitely when you are uh, in contact with somebody who's positive, uh, some people say, you know, I test right away to make sure that I'm okay. And some people say you should wait at least four to five days before testing or wait till you have symptoms. Um, so what yeah. should you do exactly? So testing right away um, is, is, if you're feeling fine, is unlikely to yield any useful information. Um, I, I've, I've recommended that people who are, especially if they're using the rapid antigen tests at home, uh, it should be a series of three. And even the CDC has recommended this, that it should be an every 48 hour test three times until you can sort of say, I'm walking away from this event. So it should take you basically to that fourth day. You know, and I, I honestly, I probably wouldn't even start on day one. I would probably wait till day two and then do the three tests from that point forward. Okay. okay. Um, and I guess a lot of people were saying too that, you know, when we couldn't do PCRs anymore, that the rapid tests were not very reliable. Um, you know, and I guess that's when they were starting to say to put in the mouth and to, and to put in the nose after, you know, so I think that, yeah, that's hard to do, definitely to see. Um, with all this, living with COVID, the new normal is very difficult and trying to find uh, ways um, to continue. Uh, do you have any like tips, you know, that you can help people to try to accept this new normal? Sure. So I'll start by saying that from the very beginning, COVID is about two things. The first thing is understanding that you can't always get what you want. And the second thing is that you have to be comfortable with the risk that you're assuming. So especially now with no real mitigation measures in place, it's about deciding whether the risk you're taking and what you're doing to protect yourself are congruent with your level of comfort in the moment and risk-wise. I'll give you an example. I go, I go to restaurants. Uh, I understand that when I go to a restaurant that people are not gonna be wearing masks and they're gonna be eating. And eating 
near someone is actually like a fairly high risk event. There's actually a lot of different materials. And the way I explain this to people is the cookie monster effect, which is when people eat, they are scattering stuff all over the place. There's little, little things going all over the place. And uh, some of it can get aerosolized. So you have to realize that there's a possibility that if you're sitting near someone who may have COVID or the flu for that matter, that you may be, if prolonged exposure, contracting it as you're eating with them. Usually this is a problem when at a table, okay? But I accept that risk if I'm going to a restaurant because for me, I wanna to go to that restaurant, I wanna eat, if I'm going to eat, I'm not going to wear a mask because that's physically not po possible. So I have to accept that I may catch something if I'm going to eat in a restaurant. On the other hand, I went to an award ceremony for my children. Thankfully, they won awards. I'm very proud. Okay. But I'm not willing to sit there without a mask on in a crowd to watch like, you know, 150 other kids also get awards. So I wore an N95, me and another doctor sitting next to me wore an N95, and everybody was sort of like giving us the weird eyeballs. But I was comfortable. I was calm. No problem. I sat there, watched the whole thing. And the 10 seconds that my kids walked across the stage, and, you know, the one and a half hours of me breathing in everybody else's CO2 and whatever else they're emitting. Yeah. But you have to be comfortable with what you're doing. Okay, that's, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the bottom line there. So if you want to go to a movie, go to a movie. If you want to go to a movie wearing an N95, go to a movie wearing an N95. This is to protect yourself. Different masks will give you different levels of protection. So if you want to have maximal protection, you get a well-fitting N95 or better. If you want to have some protection, then you wear a couple of masks, sort of like a level two medical mask or better. And if you want just some basic protection, like really basic, hardly any, a regular procedural mask. So regular procedural masks are excellent at protecting others from you. But if you want to protect yourself, really you're looking at an N95. So you just answered my next question. Definitely, it is to be, you know, is it safe to be uh, in crowds and wearing a mask? And, you know, I've been, as you say, attended certain ceremonies myself and to make the big decision of if I should or not um, and to continue the way I wear the N95. And I think wearing the N95 is very safe. Um, some people like to wear two surgical masks. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the N95, there's so many different ones out there that I think that it's very proper to, to wear that. Right? Yeah, you find one uh, that you're comfortable with, because uh, that is key. I don't think anyone here is going to find a way to get fit tested. And even then, like uh, fit testing is a little overrated. I yeah. think what's more important is that you self fit test when you put the mask on. Every time you put one of these masks on, they always fit a little differently. You have to mold it. N95s always have to be molded to your face. And so it should be, if there's different sizes, you choose the right size. And then um, you, you mold it and you go ahead and you wear it properly and you discard it. You know, the question is how, how long could you wear these masks for? So there's always different, differing opinions about that, whether you can dry them out afterwards and reuse them. I would say that, you know, four hours in one of these masks is really, if you want to retain maximal protection, four hours and toss it, get another one. When I'm at work, I wear an N95 the whole day. I don't take a chance. See, again, I want to go to work. I want to see my patients, but I don't feel that that experience is worth it to me to put myself at risk. So my colleagues, some of them, they'll wear a regular surgical mask and they're fine with that. For me, it's not worth someone coming in and you know coughing all over the place and me getting sick because 
you know, I just didn't wear an N95, so. Yeah. Okay. okay. So what would a lot of people think long COVID is? Okay, so that's like a whole nother talk. <laughs> yeah, long COVID is, is uh, you know, so, you know, it's gone also already, even in the past two years, it's gone through multiple different names, right? So initially it was called long hauler syndrome, uh, long COVID or PASC. Now we have sometimes people calling it PASC, which is post-acute sequela of COVID. Okay. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually going to be a huge problem. This is going to be, you know, I'm not going to minimize people, you know, passing away from COVID, but, you know, the number of people who have passed away from COVID is going to be dwarfed by the number of people who are going to have long-standing issues from COVID. Okay. So it's, um, yeah, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg now. The interesting thing is that it seems that a lot of the long COVID syndromes are attri being attributed maybe to delta wave and less to omicron okay so we'll see what, what that's about because we know that omicron seems to have with all the mutations that's acquired seems to have been a little more you know muted not as aggressive so maybe there's something there uh, maybe there's something that it's lost that used to trigger all of these inflammatory conditions but uh, thankfully, uh, I have a colleague at the Jewish who is actually, she's remarkable. Uh, she was, has been seeing all of the kind of uh, uh, chronic Lyme, post Lyme syndrome cases. This was her bread and butter. And now she's into the, the, the long COVID stuff. So the Jewish is one of the only places that has a long COVID clinic up and running. There's a lot of uh, other places where they're trying to get it going. Um, uh, it's not something that we actually see principally in infectious disease because by the, the current understanding is that once you're into long COVID, the infection is essentially gone. There are some people who have like smoldering COVID or this long active COVID, which is not the same thing as the people who have the chronic cough issues, the brain fog issues. Um, the energy issues, uh, these, these lingering syndromes and symptoms uh, that are not thought to be ongoing infection. There's some thought that maybe there's parts of the virus that are triggering persistent inflammation, um, but it could be breakdown products of the virus as opposed to actual live, or live, we say live, but active viral particles. Uh, so there's still a lot to understand, and part of what's going to be happening through this clinic is uh, hopefully, you know, some research into how it's going. The University of Montreal had a research clinic for long COVID for a couple of years now, who's also uh, being, it's, it's, it's headed by a very talented uh, um, uh, infectious disease specialist who was NIH trained. So she's, she's also quite remarkable. Um, and, you know, hopefully we have some more information and we learn about it. But to me, that, that has, that I'll be honest and, and say that that has been my main fear from COVID personally was having, you know, some type of long COVID symptom after the fact. Okay. So, yeah. And, you know, having COVID, I mean, you can still get infected later. Mm -hmm. Another, and how long do you think that, that if I get positive, if I would be positive and then everything is good, how long would I be able to get it again? Or if I had it, then I'm not gonna get it for three months? So uh, it depends. depends. <laughs> so, um, okay, so. We'll talk about a couple of hypotheticals. If I'm going long, just give me a sign because yeah. this might go long, longer than some of my longer answers. Okay, but just stop me if it's too much. Okay. okay, so let's say that you caught COVID and it was um, hypothetically February of 2022, okay? Reliably into the Omicron wave, probably BA1 or BA2, and 
then you sort of say, okay, uh, you know, I caught my COVID, my immune system is more or less intact. I could drop my mask for a little bit. I don't have to worry too much for what period of time. So the answer there would be between eight and 12 weeks if your immune system is kind of normal. Okay. Okay, we think. All right, because the next immune escape variant only really showed up a few months later in, in, in reasonable numbers. Now take the example of the former press secretary of the United States, mm -hmm. Jen Psaki, who somehow managed to get COVID three times in three months. Okay. okay. So, and that was like a Delta, BA1, BA2. That's what, that's what people are hypothesizing. No one knows her actual medical record, but we all know that she was absent for COVID on three separate occasions in three months. And it was kind of like, you know, like what's going on. And it was during that period of time where there was Delta, BA1, BA2. So, you know, immunologically, microbiologically, and clinically, it made sense. So it shows you that as the variants are emerging, if there's a variant with enough immune escape, then you can catch it again. Yeah. So, you know, I caught BA5 almost certainly because it was, like, you know, a few months ago. And uh, my, my, my cousins brought their cousins in from New York and they were like, oh, let's all get together. And I was like, no, thank you, because I'm going on a trip in a, in a week and a half and I don't want COVID right now. And they're coming from the United States where there's, BA, there's BQ1, BQ11. And it's, it's, a, it's a serious problem, and it may have an immune escape mechanism from BA5. So even though it's all Omicron, there are subtle differences that put you at risk as it becomes more prevalent. That being said, there is definitely cross-reactivity from natural infection. And there is some, there are groups that are recommending that once you have had COVID, if your immune system is intact, that you may actually want to continue to expose yourself in low degrees to maintain that immunity naturally. I'm not sure that's necessarily the best idea. Uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of vaccines for this. Um, I, I think that long COVID has shown us that the natural infection comes with a consequence and a price. Um, and I don't think it's a price to the individual or society that's worth you know, maintaining a natural exposure. I think there's a role for having vaccines, protections, mitigations, a little bit of cautious behavior. Um, but I think that we can abandon the sort of initial type of behaviors we had in the first, second, and third wave, and that we still see in China with the COVID zero policies. Um, you know, I think we have to learn to live, um, but be comfortable with the risks we're taking. I mean, is there a lot of the questions we talked about is, you know, COVID questions. So we are dealing a lot with people who have cancer and we do have questions about COVID and cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and what's difficult, I think, for a lot of people is how to protect themselves, you know, because if there's in a family is one is immune compromised. And then, you know, they have loved ones and they have another loved one that's not vaccinated. So definitely it's really, really hard to be able to protect the whole family, you know, and um, what is the best thing to do? Yeah, this is it's a complicated question. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely an important question. Mm -hmm. um, there's different ways of going about this. And it starts by, you know, being clear, and everyone here knows this, that cancer is not one disease, okay? Mm -hmm. And cancer treatments are definitely not the same. They could even the same treatment could be different from patient to patient. Exactly. Um, and each diagnosis and each treatment comes with potential repercussions regarding immunity, response to vaccines, um, alteration of how you respond to infection, mm -hmm. and severity of infection after the fact. So. Oop. Yeah, someone's printing out something next to me. Um, okay. There's uh, th the best way to protect. So, you know, when you're within your family, you have to decide how you want to go about living with other people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 
to me, there's no doubt that the best way to kind of mitigate things at a, on a base level is that anybody who can get vaccinated gets fully vaccinated. Okay. So full vaccination implies at least three doses and boosters if they can tolerate it. And, you know, to me, it's indicated, especially around people who are at risk. Okay. Um, beyond that, there are personal measures. So we talked about hand washing. We talked about wearing, uh, you know, personal respirators like N95s, especially when going into uh, crowded groups. However, you know, at home, I'm not sure that people want to walk around wearing N95s, right? So there has to be other considerations. So, you know, do you limit time with certain people? Do you eat at a distance from certain people? And like I said, eating together can be quite a high risk event. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, there's other things that people can do to personally protect themselves. So if people can't take vaccine because they're poor vaccine responders, then there is a medication that is still active for the time being called Evusheld, which is a monoclonal antibody pre-exposure prophylaxis, meaning that it's taken before you come into contact with COVID. Okay. And uh, this is uh, meant to help uh, protect you when your immune system is not ideal or whether you're not producing antibodies, it replaces those with antibodies that still retain some activity against COVID variants of concern that are circulating. The bad news about that medication is that with the emerging, um, the emerging variants, it seems to have lost its neutralization capacity. So it's not effective. Um, the good news is, and I just found out um, a few days ago, because I was talking to the pharmaceutical company, it's from AstraZeneca, and uh, the reps were telling me that they're actually designing the next generation of this medication. Okay. So it's a combination of monoclonals, and they hope to have a new combination which will retain activity against um, uh, variants that are circulating now and some of the ones that they anticipate might be coming up. So it's, it's a very complicated question. Um, I'm not sure that I've given like many different examples, but it really comes down to a lot of personal choice, um, taking the measures for yourself to protect yourself as best you can, mm -hmm. uh, getting vaccines for those around you if you can't take them, getting vaccines for yourself. Yes. And, uh, and then, you know, you know, understanding that every event that you attend, everything you do outside the house comes with a degree of risk and you have to be comfortable with it. Exactly. And to be comfortable in any situations that you can be in your own house also. Exactly. Many different. Exactly. Yeah. So I have kids uh, that are all in high school. None of them are wearing masks, despite my pleas to please, my, I plead with them to please wear masks. They just won't because their friends don't wear masks and they, they get ridiculed for wearing masks. Um, so I have accepted that at any moment in my house, I can be exposed to COVID, flu, RSV, whatever. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just the nature of the beast. Before vaccines were available, mm -hmm. uh, I actually kept my kids home from school. And I was lucky enough that they were allowed to have some kind of online learning. And I had, you know, because of what I do, I was able to get an exemption for the kids. You know, not everyone was fortunate like that. So in that sense, I had a bit of privilege there. But, um, you know, once vaccines came available, I kind of said, well, you know, I, if I take my vaccine, I, I, I'm pretty sure I won't end up in the ICU. So I have to drop them, like accept a new level of risk in that context. Yes. Yeah. Because a lot of people think that, you know, I've been vaccinated three times, four times. I don't need to wear a mask when I go out. But I always think to myself, you know, uh, I wear a mask to protect myself, but to protect the people that I'm around too. Mm -hmm. you know, definitely. Okay. 
A question that was asked is, is there any difference uh, between getting a Moderna over a Pfizer as your fifth booster, as your fifth shot? Yeah. So what we've seen, um, they're, they're, they're more or less the same type of technology, okay? But the actual mRNA that's being designed by one vaccine as opposed to the other is just a little slightly different. The Moderna vaccines tend to be a little more inflammatory, uh, but they give you a bigger bang for your buck. Okay. So there is actually some recommendations that suggest that people with immunities that are not up to par, that may be mixing and getting a Moderna, you know, after getting a Pfizer series provides an additional protection that might be worth it. Okay. You know, we have seen that with, with Moderna, it seems like there tends to be a little more uh, you know, lymph node activity in the arm and under the arm of the side where you got injected. There could sometimes be a slightly higher risk of uh, of the sort of chest pain or pericarditis at some people, which is, you know, a very negligible risk. Like we're talking like very, it's not a common event, but, you know, we do see a little more inflammatory responses. Some people are laid out for an extra day you know, as opposed, whereas they may have been sick for like a day, you know, after the vaccine, because they're sort of tired and feverish, they may be feverish for two or three days, you know, but they're very effective vaccines, nonetheless. Okay. Well, I see we're coming to the end, it goes fast as, as we're talking, and I'm looking at all the questions that I have for cancer and COVID, and I, I know that a lot of the questions are concerns for participants, you know, that are in treatment, if they should have booster, they should have this. And definitely for myself as a registered nurse, I always tell them to speak to their oncologist because all the treatments are totally different. Every case is totally different. So to be able to really speak with their oncology team to know exactly what is safe for them. Yeah. Um, I, I, and some, a lot of the questions like that is, and I see some of the participants also, you know, as the, um, as you spoke a lot about the restaurants and wearing and really deciding yourself out there how to protect yourself and everything between families and everything. Yeah, so I think a discussion to be had with your treating physicians mm -hmm. uh, prompts almost anybody else's advice. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are under a treatment or if you have a condition where your immune system is particularly either um, uh, attenuated or, or muted or not functional or damaged intentionally because of the therapies you're on, you should have a discussion with your treating physician whether, you know, additional therapies such as this medication called Evusheld might be appropriate. It's being underused in Quebec for sure. Um, you know, vaccines and people who are not thought to be vaccine, like a uh, good vaccine responders, you can give some people 20 doses and they won't have a response that's protective. Mm -hmm. So there, there are, there are th things we cannot measure in vaccination and immunology, which still might offer some protection. So just because you don't raise antibodies against the virus with your vaccine doesn't mean that the vaccine isn't doing anything. It just means that it may not give you the protection that we all think we're getting. Yeah. So there is adjunct therapies that can be discussed. Okay. Okay. Good. And I guess a question, one of the last questions, unless Stacy had some from participants, was I know the holidays are coming and you know we're told to wear masks inside and that. And some people say, well, I'm going to wear my mask, but I'm just going to hug everybody because they just need to have that affection. Mm -hmm. How long can they hug that person? <laughs> so look <laughs> it's like I know. it depends it depends exactly. okay. so exactly. look if, if two people are wearing masks yeah. okay and they're in a well-ventilated room they could have a good solid hug okay yeah. Yeah. um if it's a hug fest amongst 20 people in a very crowded room that's not well ventilated it's not going to matter what kind of masks are being worn after about an hour yeah. Uh, everybody in that room might be at risk. So, you know, it, it's, uh, I would say it might get a little brisk, but crack a window, you know, turn up the heat, but crack a window, turn on your ceiling fans, um, get the air moving, 
and uh, you know wear a mask when you're not eating or having your eggnog. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you can hug your loved ones. You know, get them to wear a mask. Wear your mask, hug your loved ones, uh, but you know, ventilate the rooms. So that's more important. Hey, thank you, thank you very much. I know we have five minutes left. Um, Stacy, did you have any other questions from the participants? Yes, I'm going to try to prioritize which ones. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read it as it was written. Um, so this person had their fifth dose in early October. They received the first generation bivalent vaccine. Um, and after getting their fifth dose, they were told that the vaccine does not protect them against COVID B4 and 5, the current prevalent strain. And there is now a second generation bivalent vaccine that does protect against it. Should they get another vaccine? Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to like lower my blood pressure because every time I talk about this, I get infuriated that this initial vaccine was ever offered. Okay. Because I, I'm not sure why it was offered. Okay, I have a feeling that someone made a purchase and they had to put it out there. Um, but again, the politicization of this whole disease, right? Um, at the same time as the original bivalent BA1 Pfizer shot was made available, quickly followed by the Moderna BA1 bivalent, in the United States, they were rolling out the Pfizer BA45 bivalent at the same time. Okay. And just before I contracted COVID, like I told you, I was scheduled to go to Plattsburgh to get my BA45 because for me, I did not want to take a shot that was from last year's variant when all of the upcoming variants are going to be, we think, look like they're going to be sub-sub variants of BA5. So the BQ1, BQ11 seems to have cross protection with the second generation, as you're calling it. Okay. So... Two to three months after getting the BA1 bivalent, I think it would be a reasonable choice if someone wanted to get it. Do you absolutely need to have it? I don't know if you absolutely need to have it. There is some cross reactivity between BA1 and BA4 bivalent vaccines. But for what's coming up and what we foresee in the next few months, I would say that the best protection if you respond to vaccines would be to have the same vaccine I just got two hours ago, which is a bivalent BA45 vaccine. Okay. And I might butcher the name of this medicine, but um, so someone asked, how about Actemara? Is that a word? Actemara. Actemara, Actemara yeah. Uh, right. So they say it's, it's now available at pharmacies and if we are immunocompromised slash cancer patients, how can we get this without going to the hospital? No, Actemra is tocilizumab, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just double check that because Actemra is the uh, trade name. And I think tocilizumab, Actemra is tocilizumab. Okay, so tocilizumab uh, is not something you take ever uh, on a whim. Okay, it's actually a, it's, it, its function is to block a part of the immune system that's in the inflammatory cascade. It's an IL-6 blocker. Um, and it's used for people that have various inflammatory disorders and rheumatoid arthritis and other conditions. But what it was also found to do in people with severe COVID, in the moments right as they're going to the intensive care and may require intubation, is a last ditch effort to cut the inflammatory response and avoid that intubation. So this is not something you should be running out to the pharmacy to get. And beyond that, I'm pretty sure it's, it's, uh, it's an injectable medication. Okay, and then I'll guess I'll end with one more question, which was if you get COVID, does it count as a vaccine? That's a wonderful question, which, uh, can also be explained in its own lecture series, not just one talk, but multiple talks. Um, and it depends who you ask, because 
there is some evidence that having a natural infection, especially after having a vaccine series, gives you a very good boosting effect. And a boosting effect against many of the natural antigens that are included, not just the S antigen, which is what the vaccines are based on. So that is where you get into this whole concept of uh, herd immunity and natural immunity and letting COVID rip, uh, you know, just letting it go out there and everybody just, everyone get COVID because it's at this point that everyone's had at least two vaccines and now they should get a natural shot of COVID and be done with it. However, the risk of having that is that you can contract a, a COVID syndrome and maybe end up with long COVID, although your risks are at least 50% lower if you've had vaccines. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not necessarily something you want to do to yourself is to catch the natural disease. But if you should catch it, it's thought that you have good immunity if you are relatively immune intact. And like I described, you might benefit from a protection for up, you know, somewhere between eight to 12 weeks. We think, but we don't know for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you for answering those questions and all of the other questions and for being here tonight. My pleasure. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions. I don't know if I'd be able to answer all of those even in text, but uh, yeah. it's okay. Anyhow, if there's another event that you want to plan, I am, I am game. Uh, so just reach out to me. And if you want to set something else up, uh, not a problem. We could wait till, you know, after the holidays and see what happens. Yep. Because, you know, after people get together, interesting things happen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I, I would be very happy to come back if you would like me to come back. That would be great. Thank you so much. It was very, very interesting. And I know that there was a lot of questions, but a lot of the questions were definitely answered uh, and very, very interesting. So uh, thank you very much.